I am with you always until the end of the world. How's everybody doing? Good. It's really good to be back uh, from Lebanon. We had a tremendous mission over there, possibly one of the best ever, uh, speaking to thousands of people face to face and millions of people on international television. There were healings by the hundreds, there was deliverance by the hundreds, and the awesome presence of God was manifest in the lives of all those who gathered there. We'll speak more about that later. One of the things I noticed in Lebanon, however, were the number of people who suffered from seemingly demonic influence. And to me, that is an affront. Because as Christians, we're called to lead lives of victory, of freedom, and not everyone does that. And it would be interesting to look at the reasons why we don't do that and how to overcome the attacks of the enemy. Peter in his first letter warns of the devil prowling about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He looks for the weak. He looks for the lonely. He looks for the helpless. And when he finds someone, he charges. And if you are the one he is charging against, what do you do? You turn and run? He will be on you before you take two steps. You get down to your knees and beg for mercy. He will tear your throat up. The devil knows no mercy. You stand up and fight. He will tear you to little, little pieces unless, unless you're wearing the armor of God. And today we're going to learn how to do that. I read to you from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verse 11 onwards. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of even in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth 
buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. This, my brothers and my sisters, is the word of the Lord. We are in a war. We have been in a war since the beginning of creation. And to many of us, it might seem like we're losing this war. I mean, look at the world around you. See the hatred. See the violence. See the grief. See the pain. It might seem like we're on the losing side of a war. But we're not. Because this war was won 2,000 years ago by Jesus' death and resurrection from the dead. So why is it that we're getting so beaten? I'm going to talk about this here this evening. And I pray that you listen attentively because I want each and every single person who is sitting over here, as well as all those who will watch this talk later on DVD, to walk victorious, triumphant lives. The first thing we need to understand is the devil is real. One of his cleverest tricks is to make a lot of people in this earth today think that he is a figment of our imagination. And there are a lot of people who don't believe that he is real, unfortunately, including those who should know better. The devil is real. We find constant reference to him in the Gospels. We find constant reference to him in the New Testament. We find constant reference to him in the Old. Seventeen books of the New Testament make reference to Satan and there are four others that speak about demons. In the Gospels, Satan is spoken about 29 times and the person to speak about him 25 times has been Jesus himself. Jesus had personal encounters with Satan. In fact, on one occasion, he had this very long dialogue with the man when he was taken into the desert and tempted by the devil. To say that the devil does not exist is to impugn Jesus' integrity and his sanity. The devil is real. Let's all be clear about that. Now, there are other people who take the devil to the other extreme and give him all kinds of importance, attributing to him great power, great strength. Which brings me to the second point I want to make about the devil here. The devil is not powerful. He gives the illusion of it, but he isn't. He doesn't have the power to do anything. He doesn't have the power to kill you. He doesn't have the power to stop you going to church. He doesn't have the power to stop you going anyway. In fact, if he had the power, he would have stopped you from coming here tonight and listening to the word of God, wouldn't he? He has no power. Whenever I think about him, I'm reminded of this story that I think I've shared with you at one time, but it's a good story worth sharing again. There was a man who was visiting the zoo. And when he was passing by the lion's cages, he looked inside and he saw an old man with a broom sweeping the cage. Nothing extraordinary about that except for the fact there was a lion in the cage. But this man showed no fear. Very soon he approached the lion who was sitting in one corner, took his broom and kind of dug that lion and said, move over. And the lion quietly, kind of, you know, after snarling, he went and sat on the other corner. The man swept this corner and then he went and he needed to move the lion again. So again he dug the lion with the broom and again the lion kind of snarled but very quietly it went and sat somewhere else. The man who was watching the lion was fascinated. I mean, such strength, such bravery, unheard of. And when the man stepped out of the cage, 
he caught the man and said, you're a very brave man. How could you do that to the lion? And the man turned to him and said, lion, no teeth. <laughs> and the devil is like that. He's this guy who looks all powerful, looks all scary, but man, the guy has no teeth. Say amen. amen. The only power he has is the power that you let him have. I often tell people he's like this dog that's in the house that goes mad. So what do you do? You kick the dog out. And he's still barking. But remember this. He's barking outside the house. He has no power to touch you. And we need to truly remember that here today. The third fact about the devil. He's not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything. He doesn't know what you're going to do next, for instance. He doesn't know what is going to happen in the future. If he knew that, he wouldn't have put Jesus to death. Because in Jesus' death and resurrection was his defeat. And Paul in his letter to the Corinthians says that. He said if the rulers of this age knew what they were doing, they wouldn't have put to death the Lord of Lords. He doesn't know what you're going to do next. The only time he can know something is if you open your mouth and confess it. Because he doesn't know what's in there. So be very careful about the things that you say. One of the things that I did notice on this recent trip to Lebanon and several trips before that and in conversations with people that I speak to is they constantly confess negativity. I got cancer. I got leukemia. I got a devil inside me. I got this. I got that. And the moment you say that, you're giving power to the devil. For instance, he doesn't know that you're afraid until you open your mouth and you say that you're afraid. And the moment you say that you're afraid, he says, aha, uh -huh. Here is somebody I can attack. Here is somebody I can maul. And trust me, like Peter said, he will maul you. Another fact about the devil, he's not omnipresent. God is everywhere, but the devil cannot be everywhere. There are a lot of people who come to me and say, you know what, brother, Satan came and attacked me last night. And I say, whoa, you wish. Seriously, you know, who do you think you are? Satan to leave everything and come and attack you? I mean, who are you? And we need to understand that because a lot of people talk about satanic attacks and the rest of it. Come on, come on. Satan's speaking on a hotshot guy. Someone who's really causing damage to his kingdom. And if you are doing that, there's a good chance he's after you. But if you're not doing that, there's a good chance he's just leaving you alone. So it's not Satan who has any kind of power and you need to really, really know that. And the fifth fact, and this is really the kicker. Satan is a defeated enemy. Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 15, says this. Put it up. You don't have it? Having disarmed the powers and authorities... He made a public spectacle of him, triumphing over him by the cross. He disarmed the powers and the authorities that we just looked at, leaving them defenseless. And not only that, he then made a public spectacle of them, a mockery so that everyone in the world could see what had happened to the devil so that they would know that he's a defeated enemy and lose their fear of him. And this is what we need to know here tonight. He is defenseless. He is powerless. He has no power. He cannot know what's in your mind. He cannot know what you're doing. He is honestly an insect. So why then do we suffer so much at seemingly his hands? Most of you might know stories about World War II. You know what happened? Germany went to war with the entire world. And for the longest time, everybody thought they were winning. Till the Allies, the Russians, the French, 
the British and the Americans started pounding the daylights out of the German army. Very soon, Germany surrendered. But there were areas in Germany where people hadn't yet received the news that they had lost the war. So what happened in these places? The Germans still acted like they were lords of the universe and their prisoners still acted like they were prisoners until they got the news that Germany had been defeated. There is a second element to this story. After the Allies won the war, they didn't return to their homes. They went forward and they took control over Germany, all of it. They divided into four sectors with America taking one sector, the British taking another sector, the Russians taking a third, and the French the fourth. They took control. And this is one of the things that is our problem, is a lot of us don't understand that we won the war. We think we still need to fight. We think we still need to go to war with the enemy and kind of destroy him. He's already destroyed. All we need to do is to understand, one, the war has been won, and two, we need to just go and capture the land. And this entire world that still seems that it belongs to the devil does not belong to him. It belongs to God. And we are going to go back and take it. So how do you do that now? Paul in this letter that I just read out, in this passage that I just read out, speaks about how to do it. Four times in three verses, he uses the word stand. He says, put on the full armor of God and stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the Power, the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, he continues, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. And then he says, stand firm. Then four times he uses the word stand. Have any of you ever seen a Western movie? I'm sure the older people have. I don't know if the younger have. Have the younger ones seen a Western? You have? Good. You'll know that most Western movies end with a showdown. The bad guy and the good guy. <laughs> he did that on purpose. <laughs> The bad guy and the good guy kind of face each other off, you know, and they'll be standing over there. Invariably, they'll have these quint eyes, you know, kind of staring at each other. And they'll be standing for the longest moment while music, just like what she just played, is kind of playing in the background. Then all of a sudden they draw, you know, they draw so fast, you don't know who's drawn first. And both are still standing. And then all of a sudden, one of them topples over to the ground, dead. The other guy, the guy who is still standing, is the victor. And for some reason, he's always the good guy. He's always the good guy because the good guy always wins. Are you good guys? Now, in a Western, the other guy has a gun. In our story, the other guy doesn't have anything, not even teeth. Not me, Jesus. Having disarmed the powers and authority, he made a public spectacle of them. The guy standing across from you is standing there. Sometimes he will come and he will threaten. And it, and what's he doing? He's trying to make you think that he is loaded not only with a gun, but he's loaded with a bazooka and all kinds of other ammunition, and he's going to kind of go psh, 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 mow you down. He has nothing. Are you listening to me? 
He has nothing. So what do you need to do? When he's doing all this drama around you, you know, the hours and the hisses, you just need to stand your ground and say, I am not moving from here because I have already won this war through the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. He can't touch you. You've already discovered that. He can't kill you. Otherwise, I'm telling you, you'd be dead. But he has one thing that he can do, and that is to lie. Another sign that he's not powerful at all, because if he is powerful, he comes and speaks the truth, and he frightens you with the truth. But a man who lies, like the devil does, is a man who constantly has to do things to prove himself better to, than you, or stronger than you, or more powerful than you. He can do nothing. Which brings me to one important point. He likes to play with our minds. That is where the battlefield is. And in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to talk about that battlefield. I'm going to talk about how to defend it. I'm going to talk about how to protect it. And I'm going to talk about how you can not only resist the devil when he whispers in your mind, but you can put him on the attack, put him on the defensive, chasing him back to the hell that he crawled out from. Are you ready to do that? But now I need to talk about something important. I've already spoken about it twice. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Is your boss hassling you? Does he trouble you a lot? No promotion. He bullies you. He humiliates you in front of everybody. How many of you have bosses who do that here? Don't raise your hands. I saw some hands going very quickly up. Good. Don't. <laughs> Mostly we all do. Do you have a wife who constantly nags? Who constantly tells you you need to change and be a better human being? Do you have a husband who's in the middle of an affair? Do you have a child who's constantly disobedient or worse, is doing drugs or doing something else that causes you a lot of pain? Do you have friends who pick on you, betray your confidence, sometimes tell you that you're a good-for-nothing friend? Your struggle is not against these people. Your fight is not against them. They are being influenced by this toothless wonder to do things. So when you fight with your employer, when you fight with your spouse, when you get into disagreements with your children, when you start having friendships break, when you don't have the support of those who are above you, in whatever field you might be in, Understand, don't play their game and fight back. Disarm them completely. And the way to do that is by love. It's the only way. And it's the way the enemy is truly terrified of. Your boss, whatever he does to you, don't do anything. Stand. Stand your ground. Sometimes you don't need to react. In the old days when I was younger, I remember getting into fights with people, you know. And very often I wouldn't even have to raise my hand. They'd come over there barking and growling and waving their fists in the air. And I'd kind of just look at them and smile. It would infuriate them, but they'd back off, you know, without anyone needing to throw a single blow. And we need to do that. We need to learn to do that. It's no matter what the provocation is, you don't move. You just stand your ground. And after you've done everything, stand. One of the things we do need to do, however, is to don the armor, and I'm going to talk about that in a, great, in a lot more detail in the weeks to come. But in the meantime, there is one more powerful weapon at our disposal, and that is the weapon of prayer. You pray for them. 
And when somebody, I used to do this after my conversion when people used to annoy me. I used to just pray for them and say, Lord, bless them. I used to follow Paul's advice over here in the last verse that I just read out. Pray in the spirit. And someone's over there, you know, yelling and abusing and kind of trying to get you to lose your temper. And I'm there just going in my head. Before I learned to pray in tongues, I used to say, praise you, Jesus. Glory to you, Lord. Are you a wonderful God? Thank you for all the blessings you shower upon me. Thank you for this friend of mine, Lord. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's under attack. But I know you're going to make everything all right. I know you're going to fix it. I know you're going to bring peace to their hearts. I'm going to bring peace to their lives. And I'm also saying, Lord, I believe these are spirits coming against me. Using him, using her. So in your name, I bind these spirits in your name. All quietly, without opening my mouth. And within a few minutes, the person would calm down. And you should try that. The next time your boss starts to get unpleasant, you start praising God in your name. And very quietly, you say, in Jesus' name, I bind this spirit of whatever spirit is moving in that person. I bind this spirit in your name and I cast it to the foot of the cross. And you will see within a few minutes what starts to happen. Sometimes I counsel people. Counsel people who are constantly having disputes. And I don't say anything to the person. I will say, take it easy. And in my head, I'm saying, Lord, I bind this spirit of disruption. And within half an hour to one hour, everything is fine again. You need to learn to do that. You need to learn to exercise the power that God has given you. Because God has given you the power. In Luke 10, 19, he says, I give you authority to trample over snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall harm you. What is he saying? He's saying, my power I give you. You're standing over there, standing your ground. The enemy is coming against you. You're afraid of him because of his howling and his barking and all these funny faces that he makes. You know, he does. He makes all these weird faces. Have you seen somebody who pretends they're possessed or acts possessed? They go, hey. you know, they look like idiots. Seriously. Laugh at that. Make the devil know how funny he is. Come on. They look foolish. They look foolish. I mean, I wish Satan would look at some of these things that people do. He would probably die of shame. You know, seriously. And we need to basically understand that God has given us the authority to crush them underneath our feet. So when this guy is coming at you, doing all this kind of stuff, he says, you take your gun out, or in this case, your sword, and tsh. I remember this scene in Indiana Jones, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think it was, years ago. Indy is in this town where people are brandishing swords and knives, and this one guy who comes and he does one full ballet with his sword. You know? And then he comes close to Indy and he goes back and he strings his sword again. Indy looks at him like that, pulls his gun, and shoots him. That's the way it should be with us. He's a guy who does all this drama and this dance. You have a powerful weapon in your hand. Take it out and shoot this guy who's doing all this drama. End of story. End of story. Okay? Now there's one more thing. Speaking about this sword. I was speaking about the Lebanon mission. God gave us a word. And he kept giving us this word through the entire journey. It is, it is from Isaiah 45, verses 1 to 3. It is the word he had given to Cyrus, whom he had anointed. But it's also a word he gave us, and it's a word he gives everyone who believes in him. This is what he says. This is what the Lord says to his anointed whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of the armor to open doors before him so that the gates will not be shut. I will go before you. And he's saying this to all of you sitting over here. I will go before you and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness Riches stored in secret places so that you may know that I am the Lord who summons you by name. Whenever I go on a mission,
at least these days. I go not with the idea of winning wars, but of claiming the victory of Jesus that already won the war. And the difference that it has been making has been tremendous. From the moment I landed in Lebanon, from the moment I landed, every single place that I went to was packed with people. God opened schools, God opened churches, God even made it possible for the judges of Lebanon to come and hear the word. The last one was particularly interesting. Uh, but I have somebody over here, rather than me testify about what happened there, I invite my dear brother who traveled with me to Lebanon to come and tell you what exactly happened over there in Lebanon. Put your hands together for Brother Joseph Khadij, please. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Brother Anil to give me the chance to talk today regarding uh, our mission in Lebanon. What I do normally just before uh, taking the mic, I have maybe a few seconds because I will be transformed directly to a mic and I will allow Jesus to come through me to pass the message to the people. And it's so amazing. I really hope that every one of you will experience what I'm talking about. Lebanon, in the sense that uh, it's my country, and every time I go there, I feel like, uh, like really, there is amazing thing is happening because I'm bringing uh, Brother Anil and the team to my own country, speaking my own language and deliver whatever Jesus he wants through us. But this time, it is true, it was unexceptional. It was something like we are experiencing to live heaven on earth. I want to just describe small thing. When I reached Lebanon this time, most of the program has been collapsed and I was really, I don't know what to do because Brother Anis is supposed to reach with the team second day. And I was really disturbed and I stand still. And thank you, Brother Anil, because maybe I did not le learn a lot of you, but this stand still, and especially <laughs> Peter with the story of the wind. And you know, you can describe that like a movie. And uh, I stand still, and I, I can feel that whenever something is happened like that, especially a mission for Jesus, I stand still because there is something happening above in heaven. And I want to tell this message to everybody who is looking at me now. It's not only about the message, anything happening to your life, which is beyond your capacity, just stand and wait. So I stand still and from that time until the end of the mission, we were not only experiencing joy or whatever. We felt like really a team of four and guided by the Lord Jesus. So uh, the program has been collapsed and um, every day we, we, we went. What I, I saw difference between uh, this mission and the other mission, it was the student which we met in school and in the university. There were like very feeling hunger for the word of God. Because whenever we try to, to preach and even when we start to praise with some songs, we saw the tears of their faces. And when a children like that, you know, in the school, and I can figure it myself when I was at that stage. 
somebody tell me come to, to see a preacher coming from here and there. So it is not like a really serious thing. So I enter and after 10, uh, ten minutes I see, I see myself crying. So there is something is missing. And I think the new generation of the Lebanese, because the old generation of the war, they couldn't give whatever it should be given to the children, especially the blessing of God. So I believe this generation, when they are getting married, they don't want their children to be suffering the same way. So um, we have been like everywhere in Lebanon, even some in the forest without any electricity and like we are stay, uh, going inside a, a, a um, uh, desert and at the end we are seeing the, the water. So it was like that going to street from the street to another, there is no electricity and after we see people everywhere, they park their cars beside the trees and just, it was amazing how they, uh, they accept the invitation of the Lord. And it was amazing when, 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 when we feel that, we feel that something is happening for this small country in the world, blessed by so many saints and uh, hermits. Imagine we were uh, like sometimes one o'clock in the morning while opening my mobile just before sleeping, seeing some messages asking us to go here and there. And it was like Jesus, he wants us to go in all over Lebanon. And I was really like jumping from, from uh, uh, joy and telling the people like a small child which he, he, he saw something, same like I remember myself uh, when the miracle of my wife happened, telling the, the people, everybody, see Jesus, what he did do it with me. Look here, the Jesus, I couldn't bear it. And now what I'm doing also, roaming from country to country, telling about, about the Lord. So it was, I cannot express in, in words what we discovered. We were on TV all the time. Like I was dreaming when I was young to go one time on the TV. Now every time from morning and the evening and the people, they come to us, Joseph, Joseph, do you know what's happened? Then I say, what's happening? He said, you are on TV, man, one week from day, from morning on, on TV and until evening. And I was really astonished how the Lord is doing that. If I want to really imagine myself or making a program for myself, I never imagined myself the same man I am standing here. And uh, to end... Uh, the, the, the last day, it was like meant to be uh, Brother Anil, he should preach for uh, like 44 judges, the most powerful people um, in Lebanon. Some people, they say they are more powerful than the president. I hope the president is not listening now. So these people, they were there. But I was surprised when we entered to this room, there were 135 and among them 65, 65 Muslims. And it was awesome, Brother Anil, he gave uh, the best ever talk uh, for me. <laughs> Always I said, this is the best ever, this is the best ever. However, everything with the Lord is the best ever. Uh, that's not all about Lebanon because uh, after the mission I went like two, two other times and the people, uh, they are talking to me like still we are there, like we did not left the country and I... I describe it that way that I am so blessed to stay in Dubai for 32 years, but this is the first time that I don't like to come back to Dubai because really I felt something unusual in my country. Normally I don't find it without preaching, without being with the people of the Lord. And people of the Lord, that doesn't mean only Christian, the people of the Lord, they could be any religion. The, just when we look to someone and to feel that God he is inside him. So the people, they are still on, in power and uh, they are feeling that fire. And whenever I call them, they want to invite me back. Like they want to discuss with me what's happened. Like they are, this is same like the 12 disciples, you know, and the story is still until now. So the Dutch just put the, the small seed and it is still firing until, until now. So I am, for me, this is the best ever mission. I thought on the 2nd of January 2013, when I went to the Caribbean, I say, wow, I live like the apostles, you know, going from a car to another, from plane to another, from boat to another. And I felt really the people, how much they are poor and how much really they, they, um, they are hungry. And they need really God to be in, in their life, which is, which is amazing. 
and I thought it's it is the, the thing that I can I can bear before before I die. But when I went to Lebanon, I changed my mind, and I think now I'm going to change my mind also when I go to London, and it will carry on, carry on, carry on, until I I will meet him directly in heaven, and I will ask him that time that if he is as happy from me. Thank you. For those who don't know me, my name is JB. JB means Joseph Barnabas before Lebanon. But after coming from Lebanon, I become James Bond. A lot of people, they told me the way I drive, the way I do, and including Brother Anil, not only a lot of people. So JB. So I hope that you remember that they, uh, that my name. JB could be James Bond, could be James Barnabas. It depends on the situation. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much.